but that you alone would be seen and heard working through me. God, may we be faithful to give you all of the honor, all of the glory, all of the credit, and all of the praise. We understand that all power is from you. God, we cannot do it in our own strength. Help us to not want to do it in our own strength, ever. May we fully rely on you and understand that we must always press into you. God, we're thankful that you've met us here today and that you're going to teach us. We thank you, Father, for everything that we've learned thus far in Revelation and what you're going to continue to teach us into the future. And we thank you, Father, that no matter what happens in life, your hand rests firmly upon your flock. You are not a shepherd that runs, but you are faithful. And so we are grateful that every time we call upon your name, you always have the answer. In Jesus' name and blood, I do ask, Father, that we would be able to hear clearly, receive clearly, understand clearly, that every burden and distraction would be removed in the name of the blood of Jesus. Everybody said together, church. Amen. Amen and amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy. Thank you, Lord. He's worthy. He's worthy. <clears throat> we were talking in the sound room this morning about the picture that's on the wall, uh, the dragon, and that we're going to get into in the 12th chapter of Revelation and how intense it may be. And let me just tell you, if you think that picture is intense, then just go ahead and get saved if you're not already so you don't have to be here for it. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, if you will, church, to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation, chapter 12. We're going to begin with the first verse. We're going to read the entirety of the chapter, then we're going to turn back around and discuss it and allow the Lord to teach us. Amen? Amen. If you do not have a Bible, please see me before you leave today. I want to give you one for free, no strings attached. I believe God wants you to have his word. It will change your life forever. Anybody in here can say that God's word has changed your life? Amen. Well, let's just give God glory for that. God's word changes lives. Revelation chapter 1. The text will be on the screen. Chapter 12. Thank you. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. The text will be on the screen. And the word of God, praise the Lord, says this. And a great sign appeared in heaven. Remember, this is John recording. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. And she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she, was, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver 
of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Now again, I want to remind you at this point, the church, the followers of Christ, have been taken up in the rapture. Can we say amen to that? In Revelation chapter 12 and 13, we're going to get into 13 next week. But in Revelation chapter 12 and 13, we see three main characters in the last half of the tribulation. Jot this down if you're taking notes. Three main characters in the last half of the tribulation. They are Satan, the dragon. We'll get into that in just a moment. The false Christ and the false prophet. So these are the three that are talked about in chapters 12 and 13. Again, Satan, the dragon the false Christ, and the false prophet. Now, these three will be set up as an evil, false trinity, if you will, opposing both God and his people on earth. And we just saw that in the 12th chapter. Satan. Satan is the great enemy of the church. And make no mistake about it, he fights against God and his people by accusing the saints in heaven and attacking those on the earth. However, church, however, Jesus Christ has overcome the old adversary. Can you say amen to that? And because Jesus Christ has already won, today we sit here in Christ and we too walk in victory. Amen. You and I, church, are victorious because Christ has already won. John chapter 1, verse 5, jot that down. John chapter 1, verse 5 says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 1, 5, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 1 John 4, 4, jot that down. 1 John 4.4 4 says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Hear that now. 1 John 4.4, 4, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, write that down. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4 says, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Everyone. 1 John 5, 4, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Romans chapter 8, 37, jot that down. Romans chapter 8 in the 37th verse reminds us that we are more than conquerors 
through Jesus Christ. We're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. The adversary, the adversary always works through human means. And in this case, the beast, which is the false Christ or the antichrist and the false prophet. Satan is the great imitator. You can jot that down. Satan is the great imitator. And everywhere in scripture we see that Satan is trying to imitate everything that God is trying to set up. Satan is the great imitator. And he tries to counterfeit so much of what God has done and is going to do. Everything he does is through lies. It's through deception. And it's through destruction. The beast, the antichrist, will become the world dictator who will promise to solve the problems of this world. The false prophet will be his propaganda puppet, if you will. For a time, it will seem to the world as if this evil false trinity is victorious. But I promise you, according to the word of God, that their evil world empire will quickly come to a complete and utter ruin. The nations, the nations will eventually assemble for one final battle. Jesus Christ will then appear again. And when he does, mark my words, the battle will be over. Revelation chapter 12 and the first verse. And a great sign appeared in heaven. And a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. And she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. John opens up this part with two signs that he sees in heaven. The first sign, write this down. The first sign is a woman giving birth to a son. This child is identified as Jesus Christ, and we're going to prove that multiple times today. This child is identified as Jesus Christ. The symbolic woman can be none other than Israel. And so the child, according to Scripture, we're going to look at it, Jesus Christ, the woman, symbolic of Israel. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5 tells us that she gave birth to a male child and he would rule all the nations with a rod iron and he was caught up to God and his throne. You can cross-reference this to Revelation chapter 19 in the 15th verse. Jot that down. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. We're speaking of Jesus Christ. It says the following. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Go back to the fourth verse of Revelation 12. Revelation 12, beginning with the fourth verse, says that the dragon's tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might, what church? Devour it. I'm telling you from the beginning of time, Satan has wanted to destroy our Messiah. The child is identified as Jesus Christ. The woman is the nation of Israel. It was through Israel that Jesus Christ came into the world. In the Old Testament, Israel is often compared to a woman. Isaiah 66, 7, jot that down. There's many of them, but let me just give you this one. Isaiah 66, 7 says, 
before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. Jesus came by way of the Jews. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17. Again, I'm going to read that while you're turning there. Uh, I'm gonna, while you're going to Revelation 17, I'm going to read Isaiah 66, 7 again because it's so good. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. And before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son. Revelation 17, in the first verse, the word of God, praise the Lord, says this church. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. The apostate world system is compared to a harlot. And I want you to hear that. That the apostate world system is compared to a harlot in the scripture. An apostate, jot this down, maybe you don't know what that means, is someone who forsakes his or her religion, their faith in God. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, because we just saw that the world system is viewed as a harlot. I want you to go to Revelation 19, verse 6. Where does that leave the church? If the world system is a harlot, where does that leave the church? Revelation chapter 19 and the sixth verse. Look, this is, this is good stuff. It's speaking of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 6, the word of God, praise the Lord, says this. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out. And what did they say, church? Hallelujah! The greatest praise that can be said to God himself. Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. I'm telling you, that's exciting stuff right there. We're the bride. We're the bride. Amen? The church is the bride. And the bride has made herself ready. Verse 8. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and what, church? Pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of who? The saints. Now listen. The world system compared to a harlot, and here we see the church as a bride that's pure. Jesus is coming back looking for something from the church. He's looking for a bride without spot, wrinkle, or what? blemish and the absolute only way we can accomplish that is by the blood of the Lamb of God remember earlier we read in Revelation 12 5 that the son is born and caught up to the throne of God you remember that Revelation 12 5 jot that down jot that down Revelation 12 5 that the son is born and caught up to the throne of God this verse symbolizes not only the birth of Jesus Christ, but also his ascension into heaven. The second sign that John saw was a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. Revelation chapter 12 Verse 9 makes it very clear who it is. And so we're going to go to it and read it. Revelation 12, 9. Let's go there. We'll just read this out loud together. On the count of three. Ready? One, two, three, go. And the... Stop right there. Who is the red dragon? Satan. So I don't need you telling me that it's Italy or Mexico. All right? 
I don't need you telling me that you heard some teacher say it was Russia. All right. Who's the red dragon? According to what the word of God says, it's the serpent. It's the devil. It's Satan himself. Stop giving credit where credit don't belong. It's the devil. See, look, there's nothing more that Satan wants people to do than not look at him. See, he'd rather come through the back door if you let him than come through the front any day of the week. But if he can just make us think that it's this nation doing this. And there are times in Scripture where it does symbolically speak of other nations. I got this. But don't read into something that's not there. Let's read into what is there. Verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent. So now it's personal. That ancient serpent who was called the devil and what? Satan. Here it is. The deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. Now that event's already taken place. There's no running from who that verse is talking about, folks. The red dragon is Satan. And we're going to get into this here for a little bit. If it makes you uncomfortable, just put your seatbelt on and hold on to your neighbor or something. One of my greatest joys when it comes to preaching, first is being able to present the gospel message. Second is exposing Satan for who he is. Exposing the devil for who he is. I love to be able to have the opportunity to do that because it should push people away from serving the world. There's either light or there's what? Dark. And you got to make a choice. I've got to make a choice. Jot this down. The color red. It says that it's a great red dragon. The color red in scripture many times is associated with death. I'm going to give you one that recently we've read together. You may remember when we studied Revelation chapter 6 verse 4. It's been a few weeks back. Revelation chapter 6 verse 4. Uh, it's when the second of the seven seals was open. You remember that? It's when the second of the seven seals was open and the bright red horse came. And remember what its rider was permitted to do? Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that the people would slay one another, according to the text, so that the people would slay one another. And then that rider was given a great sword for death and destruction. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. Jot that down in your notes. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 44, really quick. John chapter 8, 44. I love what Jesus is, is speaking here about some people and look, look, look at his response because in the response it talks about Satan. But Jesus replies to this particular group of people and he says, you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. So now he's going to talk about the will of their father's desires. Now watch this now. He's getting into Satan here. He says, he was a what? Murderer. Talking about Satan. He was a murderer from the what? Yes. Beginning. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Not only is he the father of lies, Jesus himself says that Satan was a murderer from the very beginning. We look all over our world today and he still, Satan still has that job of stealing, killing, and destroying. The heads, horns, and crowns of this red beast, Satan, will be mentioned again in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. You can jot that down. 
We'll be there next week. The heads, horns, and crowns will be mentioned again in Revelation 13, 1, and also in Revelation 17, verse 3. You can jot that down and look at that later as well. Revelation 13, 1, and Revelation 17, 3. According to Scripture, listen to this, according to Scripture, so I'm not going to tell you what all these theories and all these different people have, I'm just going to take you to the Word. Is that cool? I'm just going to take you to the Word. According to the Word of God, the seven heads are seven mountains. You can find that in Revelation 17, 9, and we'll be there in a few weeks as well, Lord willing, and we'll get into those. The seven heads are seven mountains, Revelation 17, 9. And the ten horns represent kings. That's found in Revelation 17, verse 12. And again, in a few weeks, we'll be in chapter 17. The dragon was cast out of heaven, as we read in Revelation 12, verse 9. And he took with him, according to the scripture, he took with him a third of the angels. That's mentioned in Revelation 12, 7, and also Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, verse 4, we just read it. Revelation 12, 4 mentions them as stars. Those angels as stars. This event of Satan taking with him a third of the angels is a reference to the fall of Satan. Jot this down. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. That event has already taken place. However, the event described in Revelation 12, verses 7 through 10, where there's another falling, is still to come. And we will read that together in just a few moments. Just as soon as the child was born. Let's get back to the child. We've got the mother, the nation of Israel. We've got the child. And you remember that it says, if you, if you look in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he, Satan, might devour it, it the son, Jesus. Jesus has always been under attack, if you will, from Satan. Now, we're going to look at it in just a moment, and I'm going to have you write some scriptures down. But just as soon as the child was born, Satan tries to kill him. You remember Herod in the census? The conflict between Satan and the woman, God's people. The conflict between Satan and the woman, God's people, has been going on since the time the serpent tempted Eve in the garden. The fight that we see today between good and evil is not a new fight. We're just the new characters in the ring, if you will. We're just another generation that has showed up in the battle. This is not a new fight. Same fight, different round. Throughout the Old Testament history, Satan has tried to prevent the birth of Jesus Christ. Jot this down. Ezekiel chapter 29 verse 3. Ezekiel 29 verse 3. Pharaoh himself was called a dragon. Jeremiah 5134. Jot that down. Jeremiah 5134. Nebuchadnezzar is called a dragon in Jeremiah 5134. The version you're reading may say monster. The original text is dragon. 2 Kings 11, 1 through 3. Jot that down. 2 Kings 11, 1 through 3. This is really interesting because it tells of the time that the royal line was limited down to one little boy because there was a lady named Athelia who destroyed everyone else in the royal family. All of the children in the royal line, dead, except for one. From the beginning of time, Satan has tried to cut off the lineage of Jesus Christ. And as I mentioned a moment ago, Satan used King Herod to try and destroy Jesus in the second chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2. 
Satan thought that he had succeeded when he used Judas to betray Jesus and was handed over to be crucified. He thought he had won, but Satan thought that the cross bought death and defeat when instead the cross of Christ, our, our Lord and Savior, the Lamb of God, instead of bringing defeat and death, it brought forth life and victory. The cross of Christ was actually victory, not defeat. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Now war arose in heaven. And so if it hadn't gotten real enough for you, verse 7 shows up. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was what, church? Defeated. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Tell your neighbor, God don't ever lose. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent. See, I told you earlier that there were two different things that it was talking about. When Satan fell and took a third of the stars, a third of the angels with him from heaven, that's already taken place. That's when he was cast out right there. Already happened. This is another event. This is where, look at it now, verse 7, Michael and his angels are fighting against the dragon. This is when war arises in heaven. Now we can read in Job that Satan has been going, what's he answer, to and fro. See, he got kicked out, but he won't kick out for good. To and fro, to and fro. But there's coming a time where his butt's going to be kicked out and the door's going to be shut. But to and fro, to and fro, to and fro. You ever kick your kid out the house and they still came back in to get something to eat? You ever kicked them out of the living room? Put them in timeout? And you just slowly hear them coming down the hallway? Because they know they still have access. They still have access. Look what takes place next. Go to verse 7 again. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. I don't know about you, but I love being on the winning team. Can we just give God praise that we're on the winning team? Last week, uh, my, my oldest son's school team um, played. He's on a homeschool team, and we played a private school. No, we played a public school last week. Yeah. Uh, we played a public school, playing against the public school, and they, they tied us, and we couldn't finish the game because there was another game coming on the field that had already been scheduled, and, and they were due to field. And the game ended in a tie. And so one of the coaches was just so happy about that. You know, he got out and we gave our speech to the kids and he said, great game, guys, you know, ba da 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 And I'm just looking like, what was great about it? Nobody won. <laughs> That's miserable, man. I mean, I'd rather lose than tie. I'd rather be told I wasn't good enough that day than be told I wasn't good enough to win and won't even good enough to lose. What is that? It's mediocre. To me, that's a lukewarm. That's, that's a lukewarm decision. I don't like that. I did not like that, so it was my turn to, to address the team. And I just lit into them. And, it, and the, parents, the parents of the next game, they've already sat down and found their place in their chair. And they start turning around like, wow, he's really giving it to them. They didn't even lose. 
And I told my team, we did lose this game. Don't you be happy about tying nobody. This is a loss, because if it ain't a win, it's a loss. So the other coach was talking about how great, you know, we did. So I pointed out everything that we did wrong. And we had four errors in the field that let six run in. We walked way too many batters that brought more runs in. No, 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 we should have slaughtered this team, not tied them. They shouldn't have scored nothing. How does a team only get two hits and seven runs still come across the plate? That's horrible. That's exactly what I said. Our pitcher threw a two-hitter, and we still let seven runs come across the plate. Unacceptable. I told them, if this doesn't hurt your feelings, if you losing doesn't hurt your feelings, we don't need you on this team. I need your feelings hurt so that the next time you come here, you're not satisfied with a tie. Why are we, and, 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 and as we're waiting for the coaches to start talking, there's a couple kids laughing and joking off to the side, you know. I said, why are we laughing? It should be painful. It still bothers me. It still bothers me. It still bothers me. Because for the rest of this season, there will be a win column, a loss column, and a one in the tie column. It still bothers me. But we showed up to our next game, and we didn't commit no errors. There was no laughing and joking. You got to take life serious no matter what you're doing. Because it may just be the last thing you get to do. I'm so thankful that I'm on the winning team of my father. So even though there was a battle, and the scripture says, the scripture says that Satan fights back, God still wins. So when you're going, so when you're going through something in life and you feel a pushback, don't let it get you upset. Don't let it, let, the devil even pushed back against Michael. So understand when you get pushed or you get pressed, don't let it deter you. Don't let it lose focus that you're still victorious because of the cross of Christ. Don't let it get you all mixed up and wondering what's going on. No, 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 no. Even Michael got pressed back on. Everybody say, even Michael. Even Michael. Verse 7. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Verse 9, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. As I mentioned earlier, we see in the book of Job, Satan having access to some degree to heaven. At one time, he was the highest of God's angels. However, as I mentioned earlier, Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15, mentions that he rebelled against God and was cast down for the first time. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. You may say, Pastor, 
I have a hard time accepting the fact that God allows Satan the opportunity to come before him to accuse the brethren. And I could understand why you would be concerned about that. But take courage, church. It will all work out for the glory of God. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Revelation 20, 10 says that Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Hear that. Revelation 20, verse 10 tells us that Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. That's a promise. That's a guarantee. He will not win. Now, allow me to show you something that will encourage you today. Let's go to Luke chapter 10 in the first verse. Luke chapter 10, beginning with the first verse. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, with that in mind, I want you to look at the 17th verse. He's talking about sending the 72 out. In the 17th verse, the 72 have returned. And Luke chapter 10, verse 17, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 says this, church, when they returned. The 72 returned with what? Joy. Joy. Huh. Normally, in today's society, when we're happy, it's because nothing went wrong. Anybody agree with me on that? Most of us wear it on our sleeve. And even when we lie to ourselves and everyone around us and we try to hide it, it's still obvious you're still wearing it. They returned with joy. Now, this is what blesses me. The road that Jesus sent them down was not easy. And we're going to see that in just a moment. But they still came back with joy. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not your problem. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands right now, but at some point in your marriage, you thought that the one you married has become your problem. But I got good news. I got good news. They're really not your problem. You thinking that way is your problem, but they're really not your problem. And the good news is, no matter what we come across on our journey, we can come back with joy. We can come back with joy. Verse 17, God is so sweet. Isn't he so good? Yes. Praise the Lord. His spirit is sweet. The 72 return with joy, saying, Lord... Even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now listen to me now. In their time where Christ has sent them out, the 72 encountered demonic warfare. They encountered people that were possessed by demons the likes of which most people in this room have never seen before. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You've just never seen it before. And let me just tell you something. They didn't come back beat 
down. They didn't come back. They did not come back hunched over. They did not come back wore out. Let me tell you why. I don't believe with anything within me that God ever calls a man for a purpose of burning him out or bringing him to destruction. When God calls one of his saints, he will equip him with everything he needs in the call. In the call. Now, the truth is, pastors get burnt out and quit because they wanted what they thought was the easy job. They then get in it and realize there's nothing about it at all that's easy. And so they quit because it either is going to burn them out or it will destroy them. Same thing if you're at a job that you thought you'd love. You get there and realize you just despise it. If you stay, it can destroy just about everything about you. My dad had a great job growing up. He was always a provider for our family. But he used to have a boss that when he would go in there, the boss would make him sit down and he would just ream him and bring all of his stress out in his home life and in his marital life out on my dad. My dad had to sit there and take it. And then finally, my dad has a heart attack due to stress. And the doctor tells him, if you keep working at that place, it's going to kill you. When God calls you into something, he's going to make sure that on the way out, you're better than you were on the way in. It doesn't mean that from the way in to the way out is going to be easy. But it does mean that he's going to equip you to do everything that you need in the process of the journey. And so the Bible says in the 17th verse, look at it please church, the 72 returned with what? joy saying Lord and this is an exclamation mark at the end of it they're excited coming back home Lord even the demons are subject to us in your name when they say this they're so excited it's like they're surprised about it and they're telling it to Jesus he already knows it's like you can almost see the Messiah kind of smirk for a moment Pretty cool, ain't it? <laughs> Pretty cool, isn't it? I've seen it. I've seen it happen before. Personally, I've seen it happen before. Where a demon has so overtaken an individual that their teeth have changed colors, their eyes change colors. Pastor Jim was with me. We've seen, I've seen it. And then in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, we cast that demon out. And immediately, the whole countenance of the individual changed. His teeth went back to normal. His eyes turned white again. And he went from trembling and shaking and screaming to crying with laughter and joy. At the name of Jesus Christ, every demon has to leave. Now listen to this, because this is how powerful the name is. At the name of Jesus Christ, listen to me, there's coming a time where every knee's going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that that name is who God says it is. Jesus is Lord. And when you understand that Jesus is Lord, there's absolutely nothing that gets on top of that. Nothing. These guys come back pumped up. These guys come back excited. They're pumped up and excited because what the Lord told them actually worked. What if you leave here today and you actually take the word of God that you've heard and you use it 
to share with other people. And you begin to pray in the name of Jesus for your family. You begin to pray in the name of Jesus for your loved ones. You begin to pray in the name of Jesus for your co-workers. You begin to use the name of Jesus the way the 72 did. And you see things in your life and you see things around your life change as they did. There's power. There's power. There's what? Wonder working power in the name and the blood. They were saved. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their what? And we do all of that in the name of Jesus Christ. They come back, man. They're excited. And they say, 17, look at it, verse 17. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. You may say, well, how come, how come the apostles, how come disciples got beaten? How they get killed if the word of Jesus says nothing's going to hurt them? No, no, you're thinking wrong. You're thinking in the physical. Jesus was talking about their soul. How many of you know Jesus does not lie? He wasn't talking about the physical body. He wasn't talking about the physical being because we know all through the Gospels what took place. We, we, we can go into, into Romans, Acts, we can just move on and just see all through the New Testament testimonies of even Paul giving of what he endured. It had nothing to do with the physical. Why fear someone? Why fear someone that can harm the body, have no effect on the soul? It wasn't about the body at all. But we should be more so concerned about the one who has control over both body and soul. So look at what takes place. They come back, man. They're pumped up. They're excited. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Verse 18, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Go to Matthew chapter 16. And let's look at the 18th verse. Matthew 16. Verse 18. And I tell you, you are Peter. Okay, this is where Peter's confessing Jesus as the Christ. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now watch this concerning the church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Tell your neighbor, we're going to be okay. You're on the winning team. The gates of hell will never, never, never prevail against the church. How furious Satan has become knowing the followers of Jesus Christ walk in victory. How furious he must be. No wonder Satan tries to convince the world that Christianity is dangerous. No wonder Satan wants unsaved people to believe that Christians are dangerous, that the Bible, the Word of God, is dangerous and destructive. No wonder he wants to convince people of those filthy, evil, dirty lies. Through Satan's deception, the nation's leaders the world leaders will unite together against both Jesus Christ and his people. It's even happening today. 
And it's been happening since the very first church. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But before we do, let's get back to Revelation chapter 12. And I want you to look at the 13th verse. Revelation 12, 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. If you look back at the 13th verse where the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth and he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, he then realizes that he's got no victory whatsoever against Christ. He thought he had him, as we said earlier, when Judas betrayed him. So the 14th verse says this. Actually, go back to the 13th verse. He's pursuing the woman. There then becomes an understanding Remember, the woman is symbolic of the nation of Israel. There then becomes a revelation, there becomes an understanding where Satan himself knows, I cannot touch these people. They are protected. And then the scripture says that he turns from her and goes out towards her other offspring. And now we're getting away from Israel and we're getting into the Gentiles. The anger and the wrath started with God, Christ, Israel, everybody else. And when he understands that he can't touch God's chosen people, he's going to come with such rage and fury that it's not going to be pretty for the unsaved in that time. There will be people, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, there will be people that throughout that time in the tribulation, remember they've got the two witnesses, we talked about that last week, okay, they've since done their thing. There will be people who have received the gospel message. There will be people who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and those people will be running in fear for their very lives. We talked weeks ago about how the punishment of that will be beheadment. There will be no buying. There will be no selling. There will be no trading, not legally anyway. We talked about how the government, the political system, uh, the world system that will come in and be set up by the Antichrist, how that is all going to be done together as one. So without the mark, it gets really hard to live in this world and not accept their world system. The Antichrist is going to figure out when I can't beat the chosen people, I'm going for those down here, and I'm coming, and it's going to be ugly. I'm so blessed as a follower of Christ that we don't have to be there. 
it mentions a flood of water. Look at verse 15. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a what? Flood. Now, the phrase water as a flood is not explained. So all you're going to get when you study it is just different people's opinions and why they believe what they believe. If you're a biblical scholar here today, hey, that's great if you understand what the flood is, but all you're doing, unless you've received some great, incredible revelation from God, is believing what someone else has already taught you. So in saying that, I'm not going to sit here and try to act like I know what the flood is. But I will share with you something that is very interesting. There's a parallel in Psalm 124. Jot that down. There's a parallel in the 124th Psalm where this flood is probably speaking of an outpouring of some type. Whether this outpouring be of hatred and anti-Semitic propaganda, who knows? Who knows? But he is going to turn from the Jewish people and he is going to focus on everybody else and it will come as a river from his mouth. And it will spew fast, it will spew quickly with today's technology, and it will spew forth very ugly. Now, it says that to protect the people, look at it, verse 15, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood, but the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Now it says that the earth, if you look at the 16th verse, came to the help of the woman. The earth did not grow legs and arms and muscles with boxing gloves. So how does the earth come to help the people? Well, maybe this. Maybe that God sends a great earthquake. We've already seen this numerous times up to this point in the scripture. But maybe, just maybe, God sends an incredible earthquake and whatever's going to happen symbolically of the symbolic flood, the symbolic earthquake takes all of that. Now, who knows? There's about three, three different ways you can view it. Personally, Depending on who you're looking at, you can find three really good people that believe three really good. It, it could all, okay, see where you're going, see where you're going. But in the grand scheme of things, it makes no difference. It makes absolutely no difference. You're not going to be here anyway. Now, I mentioned earlier that Satan has been after the church from the beginning. I want you to go to Acts. And I want you to look at the 23rd verse. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Verse 23. Remember we had talked just moments ago that through Satan's deception, the nation leaders will unite together against Christ and his people. We talked about how it's even happening today and that it's been happening since the first church. Look at this, Acts chapter 4, verse 23. And this is what the word of God says. When they were released... They went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage 
and the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. One thing that I want you to understand, if you can't plainly see in today's time that Satan is attacking the church, listen to me, if you can't see that, then you're not involved enough. It would be like you never being at your personal home and the little boy next door is always throwing rocks on the side of the house. And someone says, hey, what's the deal with the kid that stands outside your, your, your house every day around lunchtime and slings rocks across the driveway and hits the side of your house? There's dents all over it. I don't know. I haven't been there in a week. We've been on vacation. Don't know anything about it. But if he was home, if he was home, he'd have heard the attack. If he was home, he would have been aware of what the little boy was doing. So many Christians are not aware of what the enemy is up to because they're not home. In their frame of mind, spiritually, they're not home. Their calendars keep them away from home. They're not in tune to what the Spirit is doing. They're not walking with the Spirit. They're not home. And so many people within the body of Christ today just think everything is okay. No! There's a war going on against the church. A war. So much so that even in the name of a pandemic, the government tells us that we can't meet and everyone to the majority across the land is okay with it okay with it no 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 it's more than that it's a war and if you can't understand that it is you're not home man I don't mean to hurt you, but you're just not home. When you read the deception of the enemy, when you understand that he's trying to set everything up to look as God himself with his evil, false trinity, you've got to know he's coming for you. Be awake. Be home. Be of understanding. Jesus himself said, listen, if you're going to trust Christ enough, for the salvation status of your soul for all of eternity, then trust everything he said. And Jesus said, that devil that he saved you from is coming to try to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. You say, but pastor, I'm already saved. Our school team, our homeschool team a couple years ago, won 33 straight games. 33 straight games in two seasons. 33 games. The fact that we won 33 straight games didn't make anyone say, well, I'm not going to go play them. We'll lose. We'll lose. We'll lose. They still kept showing up. Everybody wants a chance to take down Goliath. Satan no different he knows that as long as the Spirit of God is working in us and we're receiving that we're receiving that and we're walking in the Spirit he knows he can't he can't he can't have victory over us he may put a chink in my armor but he can't have any victory over me but he also knows that if in a weak moment I stray he's salivating for the opportunity to take me down Yeah, maybe he won't. Maybe he won't cause me to sway from my faith. But oh, how bad he could make me look in a moment of weakness.
so many will fall to the lie of the enemy. And I want you to know this today before we pray. That's not just something that comes in the future. It's happening right now, today. Let's stand and pray. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to receive your word, to be led by your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would continue to minister to us. I pray and ask, Father, that you would continue to lead us, guide us, direct us, continue to teach us. God, I thank you, we thank you that you're in control and we're not. If you're here today and you don't know where you're at with your salvation, then that tells me that you're not where you need to be. And I want to encourage you in love. I want to encourage you in love that Jesus freely gave himself up so that you could freely receive him. And he did it because he loved you first. Before you even knew how to selfishly love self, he loved you first. The Bible says that the only way to the Father is through the Son. That's Jesus Christ. So if you want to, if you want to avoid hell for eternity, the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. Because that's the sacrifice that God presented to you. So that your sins could be forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. So if you're ready to receive Jesus, if you're ready to ask Jesus to come into your life and save your soul, just right with you and God right now you can say a prayer like this Lord Jesus I am a sinner and I ask you Lord to forgive me of my sins I recognize Lord that you died on the cross so that I could be forgiven I thank you for saving my soul come into my life lead me guide me direct me fill me with the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name and blood. Amen. Father, I pray for everyone else as we leave this place today that we understand that we're set free and set free indeed because of what you've done for us on the cross. We thank you for the victory of the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. God, we're grateful for this beautiful day that you've given us. May we, for the rest of this day, be faithful to rejoice and be glad in it. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus, everybody said together, church, amen, amen, and amen. We've got a job to do. We've got a job to do. That's to go forth and teach the lost and teach those that say they're saved but not living like it. Teach them what we're learning. To encourage them. Let them know that the time is short. To love on them the way Jesus wants us to love on them, the way he would love on them. Amen. We're going to be here again this Wednesday. If you'd like to come, we'd love to have you from 7 to 8.30. Invite someone to church with you. May you be blessed in the Lord. Let's give God praise. God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.